Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Lineup with Dave Prodan. I'm Dave Prodan, and this is episode 12. For those who tuned into our Jadson Andre episode, we mentioned that we were rescheduling when these land, so we had a small break last Friday to drop our first ever Tuesday pod today. And we'll be dropping these on Tuesdays moving forward to populate your work and school weeks. Fortunately, there's been no shortage of stuff happening in the surfing world to keep you busy these past few weeks. One of the all-time sessions ever went down at Piahi with Billy Kemper, an absolute animal, scoring the wave of his life. Anchor Point fired for the pro Tagazout Bay, won by Santa Cruz's Nat Young. And the Hurley Surf Team, the largest and arguably most impactful team ever assembled in surfing history, has begun disbanding with the likes of John John Florence, Michelle Berez, Lakey Peterson, and others already moving away. And the Volcom Pipe Pro is firing as of recording. So there's plenty popping off and no shortage of stories percolating out of the surfing world to keep us entertained, which in part relates to today's conversation. All right, episode 12. We talk a lot about stories in surfing. When I was a kid and I got introduced to it, it was undeniably the coolest thing I'd ever done. And it still is. And as I further ingrained myself and my identity into this lifestyle, I started inhaling the stories of the day. Surfer Magazine, Surfing Magazine, Transworld Surf, and the Across the Pond imports of Tracks Magazine and Waves from Australia. Not only was the act of surfing something I'd consider spiritually and physically expanding, but the stories of surfing were culturally expanding for me. Surfing became a window for me to learn about politics and art and music, gender, design, fitness, philosophy, different communities, and different ways of thinking. Surfing remains a community of radical information if you can access it. The information age, social media, and the cataclysmically seismic changes that those rendered on the media landscape inside and outside of surfing have altered this quite a lot. But those stories are still here, and access to that radical and life-changing information and inspiration are still there too. The mediums may be changing, but the stories are there. And today's pod talks to someone who traffics in these stories. Our guest today is someone who comes with a laundry list of core credentials. He's a world-class longboarder turned globe-trotting charger from the Gulf Coast of Florida. He's one of the founders of Sarasota's Catalyst Surf Shop, a student of the New School in New York, where he was an employee of the infamous Mollusk and Pilgrim Shop in Brooklyn. He was a writer for Vice, an Ocean Beach San Francisco resident, a contemporary thinker of Matt Warshaw and Lewis Samuels, a former managing editor at Surfer Magazine and the now editor-in-chief at Stab Magazine, where he's co-architected a number of projects, including the Electric Acid Surfboard Test, the latest of which is dropping right now with Noah Dean. Please enjoy the lineup's conversation with Ashton Goggins. The good old clap, take one. That's right. (laughs) How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once, let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. I thought you were boxing. All right, so uh, we are here with Ashton Goggins. Ashton, you're on the lineup. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Dave. It's been uh, cool seeing you get this platform finally. It has. Uh, sure, it's been a long time so. coming, my man. <laughs> I guess so. I feel like we've talked about trying to get you to do a podcast over the years. I've been like, I think at Surfer and at Stab, I was like, who would be good to host a podcast? It's like Dave fucking Prodan. It's a short list. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I tried to do my own for a bit just for fun, just because I'm like, oh, look, we're, we're having these conversations. Yeah. It should happen. But but that's that's actually not a bad starting point because you today, now correct me if I'm wrong, are the editor-in-chief at Stab Magazine. I am in so far as a online outlet requires an editor-in-chief. <laughs> well, that, I'm glad you brought that up because I would love for you to describe for me and everyone listening what that job in the surfing world entails in 2020. Mm, let me let me let me uh, let me formulate my my explanation. Uh, I think, no pun intended, I have to wear a lot of hats and. Uh, that just sort of comes to the territory of, you know, you think about the, the we're, Stab tends to think of themselves as being somewhat platform agnostic. It's like podcasts, YouTube, Vimeo, Instagram, like all those things sort of require their own treatments and their own ideas and their own concepts. And so for me coming from, you know, my first job in the surf world was at Surfer Magazine and coming from a, you know, an institution where 
every six weeks or you know at this point every two and a half months like you're putting out a magazine and that's your focus you come in every day and you're working towards this this end this goal this you know this print date yeah running stab is completely different it's like a hamster wheel there's no stop no flow like no stop to the flow of information no stop to the flow of news no stop to the flow of projects that we're working on that we're rolling out and so there's none of that like release and then like slow build up to deadline which is what i think a lot of people really enjoyed about working in print was like getting to work on something for like a month thinking about it really hard for a long time and then seeing it come to fruition which you know with very few exceptions is pretty hard to see nowadays yeah, we were, um, I was talking to someone about that too, and it, it was they were just like, yeah, there used to be like whole staff built around like photo selection, you know, <laughs> and like photo selection. It was even even beyond the quantity of people working on it. It was like the time that it took to get the photos in, to sit there and have a proper discussion about it, to whittle it down, yeah. to then put that through a review. Like all all that in between time created like connective tissue for people to imbue whatever the final product was with like way more meaning and purpose than the current digital age affords in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with Grant Ellis at Surfer at the very end of his like 20 year reign there. And, you know, to be able to walk in and see that sort of ecosystem, which, uh, to, you know, more or less doesn't exist anymore. As far as, you know, a whole stable of photographers around the world submitting photos from every swell, him having to filter through them, letting us know what's going on, and like him being the sort of like filter through which all the best material came through. Uh, whereas nowadays, it's you're sort of just scrolling through Instagram and seeing if something might be a little bit more interesting than something else to deserve more attention. When I started at the ASP in 06, our head of photography was Pierre Tosti, and mm -hmm. there were still the remnants of the like rock star surf photographer out there, you know, yeah. like. Um, Aaron Chang and Pete Frieden and Steve Sherman and all these guys. And my understanding of how it went was that Pierre was like the first person in the surf photography world to buy a digital camera. And I think he told me he spent $25,000 on it. And that just like all these guys with amazing archives and artistic sensibilities and just ability in general, like it, it transformed their world so much. And so that's kind of I mean, I think probably you and I are about the same age. How old are you? 35. Yeah, right. So I'm 36. Same exact age. <laughs> um, and um, But like it, it was probably like really formative in our careers because we had a front row seat to what 100%. that did in, in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, and for me showing up and sort of after the fact with that and sort of getting the story behind all of those shifts, you know, like thinking about when Evan and Marcus and all the guys left to go do Surfline in the late 90s you know what i mean it was like all of a sudden there was a platform on a computer that was the one place that everybody had to go to get information and it created you know immediately it was just like huge bleeding of creative people from all the other surf magazines that all jumped on digital and i think marcus sanders might be the last one that's there god bless his heart <laughs> from that generation uh but yeah it was i think that it was really seismic for a lot of them and some of them were able to shift and figure out how to like move into that next chapter and some of them just sort of kept plugging away because they you know whatever their their ambitions are fairly you know limited to this world so it's you know to them it's like they, they're going to operate no matter what they have to do and i think about guys like brian bielman mm. who are still you know like on boats at chopes when there's a good swell and like yeah. still living that lifestyle but who've been fairly like uncompromising about still doing shows and selling prints and like you know trying to keep their stuff in like a-list magazines and submitting to the right people. But I don't think that that's the case for kids that are under, basically younger than me. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that technological singularity, it impacts like even people who are focused just on written word storytelling as well. Like, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like for myself, like a new platform comes out and I'm just like, ah, I'm old, I don't care, you know? And yeah. then all of a sudden I'm like, I, where where is the place I can submit, you know, 500 words and people will read it? You're like, well, it kind of doesn't exist unless you do all these other things too. Like, 100%. It's kind of exhausting uh, for me. It's hard for me. I mean, you know, because I feel like we are a pretty robust organization nowadays. And I feel like to the to the outside, most people see us as being like fairly prolific online. Right. And so we get requests from people that are from writers and from photographers all the time, just like wanting to publish their work. And some of it's, you know, obviously great. Yeah. 
uh, but there just isn't that much space for it nowadays. There's only so many places that people want to go look at a photograph specifically that's not just scrolling through Instagram um, or where they want to go and like read a story. You know, it's I think that we the, the biggest features that we get as far as time spent on page for longer features are always like these sort of long sprawling interviews. Right. Uh, you know, we, you can write the, the most beautiful, like, telling profile of a surfer, you know, in the style of all of the people that we looked up to growing up who wrote profiles, and it'll get about one one-hundredth of the eyeballs of uh, something that's got a more internet-specific package to it. Yeah, gaming, the SEO kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, and I would extend that out, like, the surfers themselves and their filmers and editors, like, gripe about this all the time. They're like, Jesus, like, I worked for six months and spent... $30,000 of my own budget on this, you know, three minute edit and it barely made a dent for half a day. Yeah. Like that is, I mean, it's so hard. Whereas like 10, 15 years ago, that would have been like a release film and that would have oh. like ensured your sponsorship for three to five years beyond yeah. that. Like, yeah. And I feel like it's, it's pretty disheartening for a lot of people um, in that sense. But to, you know, what my answer to that has always been is that you have to create that positivity mm -hmm. and that engagement around your projects, whether it's premieres, you know, when we, when we do bigger projects, we try and premiere them of as many places around the world as we can all at once. Because to me, that's what was always the most like important part of surf films to me was like going to surf, going to a surf film premiere, being around like the community of people that you surfed with every day in your town and seeing what the best surfers in the world were doing together and like sharing that experience. And to, to me nowadays in the age of like sort of social media isolation and technological isolation, those sort of moments, if you can create those around your projects, I think has a much more lasting impact and feels like something that you missed out on if you weren't there. You know, whenever I see a premiere, like you guys did the CI like board release. It's like, Channel Islands released two new surfboards last week. And, I mean, surfboard companies do that every couple of weeks. They release a new model. But they threw a party. They had all their, their, their surfers come out. They had food and music. And all of a sudden, I was like, ah, oh, bummed I didn't go to that party. Right. But it makes you think about the fish beard and the mid-length. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah, you got to create those cultural moments. But yeah. before we get into some of the projects that you're working on sure. this year, I, I do want to track back a little bit and get the Ashton Goggins timeline of... <laughs> <laughs> where you came from mm -hmm. and how you got into surf journalism and, and your current role a little bit. Okay. How far back do you want to go? I mean, as far, <laughs> as, far back as your memory suits. Um, so I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Florida uh, in a little town called Nokomis that's about an hour south of Tampa, about 30 minutes south of where Corey and Shea Lopez and Pete Lopez are from. And my dad was a surfer uh, from the 70s who, before I was born, had done about 10 years between Northern California and Central America. Well, parts so, of Central America. He was in Costa Rica, Guatemala, Bolivia. Just surfing. Uh, yeah, and doing what what other sure. what, what what characters during F that period? Fun, of, funding surfing. <laughs> funding surfing. Okay. Uh, yeah, he statute of limitations <laughs> has passed, man. Don't worry. Uh, he says it all the time. He's like, I don't care if you talk about it. <laughs> um, but I I I, uh, I'm, I tend to be a little bit sensitive to it. But yeah, there there was a, a period of piracy for my pops, and then he settled back down, had me and my little brother. And when we were tiny, I mean, there's like little, you know, we grew up in the probably the one of the better places you could learn to surf as a small child as far as it just being warm water and tiny little waves. But, you know, when we got nine or ten years old, we started started to outgrow it. So my dad had to start traveling a lot. So we ended up spending most of our time on the road driving around the East Coast, going to surf contests. My dad was the local, like the ESA commissioner for the, the West Florida wow. uh, commissioner. So he ran all the contests for us when we were kids. And um, So did you, was that, did you compete because Pops was commissioner no he was the opposite he 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 became the he, he like he was the type of dad that would like be the baseball coach because we played baseball and he wanted to hang out with us like he didn't give a shit about baseball yeah and he couldn't have cared less about surf contests but he just loved how into it we were oh that's cool and you know like you know big fish small pond stuff my brother and i for little kids on the gulf coast like we did well in contests we were always making regionals and you know the east coast championships and stuff and for him i think it was cool just to see and this is sort of where i think that like I got that bug was like for him it was cool to see us become friends with kids from all up and down the east coast and you know all over florida so you know when we got to 13 14 years old we were going off on our own and staying with friends for a few weeks weeks at a time on the east coast cuz there's never waves on the gulf and this is the 90s essentially 
Yeah, early 90s, mid 90s. Yeah. Uh, so, For, formative era for the Gulf Coast with the Lopez brothers and what's uh, really going on, what's really going wrong. All Mike around. Riola. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot of proud uh, Floridians in exile out here that you'll run into <laughs> from that era still. Um, but yeah, for, for us, that was, I, I would say without question that what's really going on, what's really going wrong, Lost Across America, Five Five Nineteen and a Quarter, like those movies for us were so monumental, not just because of, you know, them being two hour long surf films with every surf spot in California and the East Coast and anywhere else that we'd ever like dreamed of. But it had like the best day of all time on the Gulf Coast still. <laughs> right. And every everyone on with the, the West the Coast was like, segue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everyone on the West Coast would watch that and be like, I don't know what they complain about. Look at that. It's, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It looks like, so fun. Like little little babies like shore break skeleton bay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, an- another Florida laid a claim. Uh, Skele- Lopez skeleton, and skeleton Bay. Bay. Ooh, yeah. It was on the monkfish. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> it's like my mayhem core score up there. But I think that, the, yeah, so the town that I grew up in, that, that those films and that like sort of vibe was super infectious to our area. So it was like a lot of derelict 17 to 25 year old guys who were like partying, like up to no good, oh, yeah. punk rock kids, just causing trouble. But yeah, so that those were like the two worlds for me growing up was like punk rock and music because there wasn't waves all the time. And then whenever there was surf, it was like, that's all we did. Yeah. And I feel like I, that's like a, in, something that's very ingrained in me. It's like, if there's waves, you surf all day. Because on the Gulf, you'd get 24 hours of swell. You would surf literally until you couldn't move anymore, and then it would be flat for 10 days. And so if you didn't get it, you were bummed for a long time. Uh, so nowadays, I feel like I, I definitely have a reputation for being a little bit over-frothed when the waves get good, but I take pride in it. <laughs> I, 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 well, I mean, it, it's all relative too, right? Like we had someone out here from the East Coast last week, and it was small out the front, and they're like, you guys have no good, no idea how good you have it. No idea. Like you're not even looking at those waves. Yeah. And like, it's amazing that you live somewhere where you can surf every day because I'm from Florida, and you cannot. And I said, yeah. But then you get someone from Hawaii here, and and, you know, We'll go to Hawaii and surf, you know, like three, four foot Rockies and be like, is this not like the most fun day ever? And they're yeah. like, well, I don't even have a board smaller than six, eight. Like, why mm-hmm. would you bother kind of thing? So it is, there's a little bit of relativity. Uh, yes. The, the surfer's theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Impactful well outside the surfing world yeah. for sure. So yes, anyhow, so growing up in the Gulf, uh, when I was about 18, um, I moved out to California for like six months to do the Jimmy Buffett World Longboard Tour. I don't know if you remember, but he did the Margaritaville World Longboard Tour for for two seasons and got like a pretty good taste of California and hated it at first. Mm. I felt like a real alien, uh, especially I was living in Encinitas and yeah, just being a poor kid that was like into punk rock and longboarding, like cruising around like Yogaville, like yeah, white you, bread San Diego. You occupied a very <laughs> specific demographic. Yeah. You're like, who likes single fins and black flag? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. I remember like standing on the cliff at, uh, at Swami's one day and there was a kid wearing like a Marilyn Manson shirt or something like that. And I was just like so grateful that there was a kid that just was like weird. I just remember just walking up and talking to him. Be like, are you from here? <laughs> He's like, no, I'm from it Florida. It was like seeing an alien. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, so I did that for a little bit, and then I moved back to Florida and, and started the surf shop when I was like 18 with two really good friends. And this would have been about 2002, so it was like sort of that sweet spot, like right when like surf became sort of massive. Right. And there wasn't really any core surf or skate shops where I was from at the time. We were sort of the first real, like like you could go and get world-class gear. What was it called? Uh, the Compound, still there, the Compound Board Shop, Sarasota, Florida. Uh, I think they're celebrating their 18th anniversary this year which is crazy uh it was me and two friends jacob shields and matt clippard and jacob owns the shop now matt and i both stepped away about probably 12 15 years ago and then i just decided i'd want i'd always wanted to be a writer and i always wanted to go to school and a guy named larry mayo who builds boards on the east coast took me up to new york city for a surf trip to go shoot photos and i was there for about 24 hours and was like oh okay I'm going to move to New York City, like have to. So I came back, applied to a bunch of schools there and ended up going to the new school in New York and working at Mollusk, which is now Pilgrim in Brooklyn. And I feel like pretty much every door that I was able to open in New York, like that was what sort of set the path for me to end up doing what I'm doing. Well, I'll I'll pause there too before before we move on because this is probably, I'm trying to think, 05, 06, 07, Mm. around that time. You're a weapon with timelines. That's okay. Um, (laughs) So it's one for 10. And I feel like this was pre-social media hit the surfing world really hard, right? And to me, this was like a high watermark when surfing, and I'll use surf journalism as a a vessel for this, 
was actually a conduit to experiencing like a broad culture, you 100%. know, where it's like, I'm surfing, I'm a surfer. I get surfing magazine and trans world and surfer and, you know, tracks when I can and smuggle it in. And I read about surfing, but it's also becomes a touch point to music and art and like other people and travel. And to me it, it, at the time, it was like a broad expanding kind of experience what I feel like happened, you know, post social media for a lot of surf media anyway, was it became so self-referential for a period of time. Totally. It kind of disappeared up its own asshole. Yes. Right. And this is like uh, early 2010s kind of era. For sure. Totally, yeah. totally. But it sounds like yeah. similar similar to that timeline or like in, in concert with that timeline, that shop for you was like a, it was like a window to broader cultural. A hundred percent. And it was cool because, you know, we had a blog that was called Shipworm and Gribble that was like a real popular, you know, that this is like when you could have like a surf blog spot that people would actually go and like, you had a little list on the side of all your like friends blogs. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it was killer. You know, in that time, there was all these people that were operating. You had Lewis doing post-surf. Yeah, run uh, muck visuals. Yeah. That was and, a big one. And this would have been like, you know, right before Dane did Marine Layer. Yeah. It was sort of leading up to that. Uh, yeah. So it was this like ecosystem for like conversation and comments. And it was the first time I'd ever like interacted with like the surf world on a, like that sort of a platform where I was like commenting back and forth to people. And it was amazing to see the people that came through that city at that time, you know, like, you know, we had Derek Hind and Andrew Kidman and Thomas Campbell and Dane came through for a few for the, you know, at that point it was right when I left was when they did the Quicksilver Pro in New York. That was the summer I left. And that felt like a like it, like the end of an era, you know, it was like all right. of a sudden New York was like a mainstream surf destination. Yeah. But up to that point, it felt like we were part of this like very cool little subculture that when people came through, they got to sort of intersect with it through us, which felt really special to like be able to share New York like that and to have that experience, you know, going to college and, and having that world just sort of come to you without me even realizing it. When I moved to New York, I told myself that I wasn't going to surf. I was like, oh, I'm taking a break from this. I need to focus on other things. And like a month in, I had ordered the thickest hotline wetsuit that I could find and what and what prompted you to leave New York have you ever seen that movie the 25th hour oh yeah you know that scene where he looks in the mirror and he's like fuck you fuck me <laughs> that's how I felt when I left New York I like wanted to burn that place to the ground I feel that way once a week man <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I think that New York, you know, it either like you either make it or you don't. And I think that that's like a, it's a hard thing for a lot of people, but you know, I was lucky enough to be in school there. So it didn't feel like, you know, my goals there were just to finish school and to the enjoy The ceiling it. for success was yeah. low enough where I'm like, if I graduate, I've made it. Yeah. And, and yeah, well, I'm with you. And at that time it was probably the most expensive that New York had been. So, mm. you know, coming straight out of school and like looking at like a $50,000 a year fact checking job at the New Yorker when your rent is 2200 bucks and it's it, like it's so fun like i think you grow up and you have an idea of new york and i've been there a few times for most recently for work in the last few years and it, to me it feels like there's a version of new york that is essentially a video game the object of which is to never be on the street level yes like if you can have a penthouse yeah. and take a helicopter to your office <laughs> and then another one to your dinner, yeah. you win. Yeah. You know, and so I feel like it is an endless I mean, I'm I'm not the first person to coin the term rat race, but it's like I feel like I would uh, oh, if I were there, I would over obsess on like I need to get up to the 13th floor and then the 20th floor yeah. and then in my life and it's yeah. like, oh, the association <laughs> with value would drive me bananas. Oh, yeah. And it, and I'm cheap, so it would be a nightmare. <laughs> You know, I've always, you know, I'm I'm very proud of uh, of having always been the poor kid around rich kids. And New York has a way of like really, really making you aware of what that actually means. You were super proud, super proud. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was it, it just. I think it got to a point where I was like, okay, if I need, if I'm gonna like grow from this, I need to like take this education that I've had and go elsewhere. And I got offered a job at the New York Times uh, at a paper that they had in 2000. I think 2009, 2010 was when it happened, when I left, 2010. Um, and at that time, the New York Times still had like 16 regional papers. And so the paper from the town that I grew up in offered me a job as like an arts and culture writer. Ooh. And the day that I got, like, started the job, they lost one of their food writers. And so they were like, do you know how to write about food? And I was like, I've never worked in a restaurant. I've never read a food magazine in my life. And so I ended up doing that for like a year and a half for them and for Bon Appetit and for Vice, um, just sort of randomly. Mm. And what was cool about it to me was just like seeing that writing and sort of doing this type of work, it has it has some real tangible effect in when it comes to businesses and and to local companies and things like that. And for me, 
seeing like, you know, walking into a little like Chinese restaurant in Florida and having them like have a review that I wrote framed on the wall, it like gave purpose to what I was doing. And so I was doing that. And then I got offered a job in San Francisco for GoPro as a copywriter and at a company that two brothers and Jack Dorsey from Twitter started called Sightglass. It was like a third wave coffee company and like coffee roastery. And so I was working at GoPro and then working for them. And then Vice hit me up to do these stories about going to origin for where coffee's grown. We were going to Ethiopia, East Africa, South America, Central America, to these small sort of like niche coffee growers in all these regions. Because at that time, that was like sort of all anybody wanted to talk about was craft coffee. But yes, I was doing that and living out in San Francisco. My brother moved out. We had a great little place in the sunset and sort of the same experience that I had in New York, I had in San Francisco of just feeling like it was like this amazing little world of people doing really interesting things. And especially the sunset, the neighborhood that's out on the beach at Ocean Beach. You know, when I moved out there, I had a, I sort of got plugged right back into a little circle of people just from the, the guys that ran Mollusk in New York. They had the, the Mollusk in San Francisco, you know. And then for me, the people who were the, the most enormously influential was Lewis Samuels, Marcus, Brian Dickerson, who used to run Surfer's Village, yep. and Matt Warshaw. So I, I, me and Matt were like ships passing the night when he left San Francisco. But when I was living there, a few people were like, you know, even just neighbors that knew him. They were like, oh, how do you not know Matt Warshaw? And so... You know, I got connected with him and Lewis and then eventually Justin Hausman from Surfer and was, you know, I, I, I wrote a few pieces or wrote a piece for the Surfer's Journal and then I did a piece for Surfer and Todd Bradonovich, the editor of Surfer, was up there for the San Francisco Marathon or something and hit me up because they were looking for, you know, Warshaw had, t had told him that, you know, to, to have a conversation with me about what I was looking to do. And, and Kradonovich, the editor. At the editor of Surfer, yeah. Fun, fun fact, when he got that job, I sent him a note saying, you know, congrats because I've worked on the comm side of things at the ASP at the time. And he wrote back, and because Prodan is a derivative of Pradonovich, it's Romanian, and he, he sent me this photo. He's like, this is our common ancestor. It's like <laughs> some dude in like a spike helmet. And I'm like... That's awesome. And I remember I like told that story about like Todd, every time he'd come up, every time Surfer would come up, I'd be like, you know, he and I are related. <laughs> and I'm sure we are. And then I brought it up like a, a few years ago when he came to Surf Ranch. He's like, oh yeah, no, that photo was bullshit. I was just messing around. And I'm like, oh, all right, that's cool. Um, <laughs> but, but quickly too, I do want to, I do want to touch, I'm sure we'll get to it, but, but I'm going to get to it now. Lewis Samuels and Post Surf. Yes. So this is 2011, 2012-ish. Yeah. I think a lot of people maybe listening now don't know what he did or who he yeah. was, um, but maybe give a little bit of background about that. And then I got some, I got some takes on poster from my time on this side of the fence. <laughs> I think that, you know, I think Lewis always describes post surf as being like a conceptual art project. Uh, he would, he would describe <laughs> it that way. <laughs> but, you know, Lewis is one of the, he, he is without, any question, one of the most intelligent people I've ever For spoken sure. to is that, you know, and, and surfers, non-surfers, anything. He is someone with a certain set, like a, a type of intelligence that I've not experienced anywhere else. And I think that's pretty telling by what he does for work now. But at the time, he was just this sort of really, uh, he was a very literate, very like philosophically driven critic that came at it in a way that was like, the honey that made the medicine go down was like the most fantastically offensive humor yeah. <laughs> to and the people, to the, to the, to the audience. It was not offensive, but to oh, it's the, the surfers. And, and what we're talking about for anyone that isn't aware of it, post surf was essentially a version of the power rankings that he would look at the CT, which at the time I think was the top 45, I think still. And he would write it for Surfline. Yeah. Initially wrote it for Surfline. Surfline paid him to write this ranking. On the model that Derek Hind had started in, that's the, right. in the 80s in Surfer. That's right. Yeah. And I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure someone will remember this, but like, I don't exactly know the straw that broke the camel's back, but his criticism landed too true at one point and caused an issue with the sponsors at Surfline. And Surfline was like, you, you, this is done. You're <laughs> yeah. done. And I remember there was a brief... Do you know the whole story with that? I don't know if we can talk no, yeah. about it with sponsors. Well, uh, yeah. well, I don't have any sponsors here, it, so let's lock ourselves <laughs> off. <laughs> so it was during the sort of crash in 2008. And at the time, you know, the ma I don't know, we, can, we won't mention major brand names, but one of the top, one of the <laughs> major your four... imagination. <laughs> one of the major four brands was undergoing like enormous layoffs. And they... Well, good thing that's changed. <laughs> 
It's, you know, we are glad we lived through that one. We'll get to that. Don't <laughs> worry. It's on my notes. But he wrote a piece criticizing the CEO for taking like an all expenses oh, yeah. trip to Tavarua when it was still private to sort of like, you know, it was a bunch of like fancy benefactors of the brand. Sure. And it got, yeah, got Lewis canned. Yeah. It, it, it resulted in a number of conversations, yes. which killed Lewis's post serve at Surfline. There was a brief period of hibernation and that it reemerged in its uh, out of an incubation on its own with, I dare say, more bite. Oh, yeah. And, and this, and I was on tour at the time, and this to me was sort of an inflection point in that up until that point, there'd been maybe tiny pockets of restrained criticism. Sure. But the surfing industrial complex and its relationship to the media throughout really the Audis kind of neutered that in a lot of ways. So because there was so much money. For sure. You know, right? I mean, that is what it is. It's like until a brand has enough money to push people around. Well, yes and yeah. And I think it's, I mean, we can talk all day about this. I, I think it did have something to do with the idea of these brands are growing from $50 million valuations to $500 million valuations. And the expertise being brought in to shepherd that was very PC culture and very, no one says anything wrong. And it's all advertorial and et cetera, et cetera. I remember people losing their minds on tour because there had been this period of quiet and like, we're not saying anything negative about yeah. anyone on tour. These are all special snowflakes. <laughs> and the second these things hit, people, like the CT people, like the people competing on tour were like, like jumping over one another to read when these things landed. Oh, yeah. And were so angry. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but... but <laughs> Yeah, let's, I mean, there are people that lost their minds over it, yeah. which in a lot of ways was kind of like a wonderful, what's the word, like immolation, really, like of, <laughs> Perfect word for of, it. of media and industry and ego. And it kind of reset the tone for a lot of people in terms of like, yeah, like if someone is doing something I don't like, I'm going to say it. Yeah as opposed to not and it kind of rode in on the 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 advent of the information age really coming um on and strong I, yeah. I think what was special about lewis's and this is still something that i feel like i try to impart on our younger writers is that he was always funnier than he was cruel oh yeah and that's the to me is the was always the he was funnier and smarter than he was cruel. It's really easy to be like cruel and snotty. I mean, that's the uh, the capital of a billion anonymous commenters on these sites. But to be really, really like critical and to, and you know analytical with that sort of literary like honey that makes the medicine go down, that's a rare combination. I, I remember like this reminds me of like a profile I read on uh, Trey Stone and Matt Parker at South Park. And the person profiling them was, I can't, I'm going to mix up who it is. So I'll just say A and B. They said, one of them is hands down the funnier one, but mean. Yeah. Like <laughs> really mean. And the other one is funny too, but like sweet. Yeah. And so when the, that genius comes to life in South Park, it's this balance of, yes, they're making fun of whatever, but that comes from a place of like real love, you 100%. know, which I think is similar where it's like, you know, the, the, the <laughs> more dramatic and damaging parts of the current uh, media age, there isn't that balance. You know, yeah. it's like I have an anonymous handle and I'm going to hammer the shit out of anyone I can yes. um, with, with no point. Yes. Really. I'm just, I'm just tearing people down. Yeah. And to no end either, you know, I mean, mm. I feel like Lewis's best work was always when he was like railing for something. I remember when the, was it the Volcom, was it the Volcom contest in Fiji that got called off? Was Volcom the sponsor for it? Yeah. When it was too big, the Code Red one? Was it the, I Co always get those. That one was Code Green. Code Green. Because we, yeah. So the, the story, the story, this would have been 2013, I think. Yeah. Because I think 2012 was their first year. I, I intimately remember this because I was um, gifted a Tavarua trip once a year for a few years. 2012 was a really good year. 2013, I think, was the monster year. Yeah. And this was the year that it was getting big, getting big. It was getting bigger all day. Um, I think we ran a couple of heats and like Adam Melling and B. Durbage got annihilated. Someone and got hurt. Then we went on hold. We were in two heats and then went on hold. I don't really know where that decision came from because it was only getting bigger. We're yeah. like, what's going to change? Like, 
<laughs> you know, I, I think we were thinking, oh, we're going to go to West restaurants, but then the direction was not good for restaurants. So, like, I think I was on the island. I'm like, oh, restaurants is like three feet. And yeah. You know, and meanwhile, like, some of the best big wave guys in the world, John, uh, John, all those guys are yeah. on like borrowed boards, I, I, getting the craziest yeah, ways. The, the report from the channel was we were on hold for like three or four hours. And for a while, it was just, I think it, I think the story was it was Nathan Fletcher towing John, John into step offs in front of the entire top 34. And all the big wave guys. Oh yeah, for a while. I yeah. think he was just out there by himself, like getting <laughs> totally kegged. And then, and then the decision came back from the channel, and they're like, "We're gonna, we're we're calling competition off for the day." And I remember grabbing the guys from Volcom, and I said, "Look, this is going to be an unpopular decision. Whatever you have to do, keep the feed running." That's right. You had something to do and with that's, that. And that's well, the smartest I mean, I was, move they've I ever was done. part of a group saying yeah. this, right? And and that's why they called it Code Green because yeah. we kept running the, <laughs> the broadcast. I've watched that live broadcast or whatever the recap from it probably like 50 times. The and most, yeah, the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life happened. We're on the boat and everyone's getting ready and Wassel's there and he's like drinking beer and like the, everyone's out there. Everyone's out there like getting like the waves of their lives and Wassel's like, yeah, and he had a couple beers and he's like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to go out. Hops off the boat Paddles out, like, waving, you know, also just, like, super friendly, super funny. Waves to everyone, like, paddles right out to the ledge within 45 seconds. <laughs> like, the heaviest wave of the day comes. He turns. He gets kegged all the way across the reef, kicks out in the channel. People are losing their minds. He paddles back to the boat and cracks another beer, and he's like, well, I'm not, it's not getting better than that. That's... And I'm like, dude, that... I <laughs> I've never seen <laughs> anything before or since that has ever... Nothing's looked like that ever. Yeah, there's a there's a reason that Dave Wassel looks as comfortable as he does. Yeah, he just was, in the world. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, once he you, is like what? a hard, a hardened from steel. It, yeah. He's kind of like one of like the tall tale figures from American history, you know. Like it's like he's kind of like John Henry or like Daniel yeah. Boone or something. Like that's what that's his deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so that was anyway, so back to Lewis's point on Oh yeah, on I just the, remember, yeah. you know, and and what I liked about Lewis is that he could back up most of what he said, whether whether from an analytical standpoint or from just a surfing standpoint. And yeah, that Lewis one charged. he was like yeah. <laughs> he was like if I was there out of just being a surfer, I would have to paddle out. Like with waves like that, like I'd probably die. That's fine, but like I'm a surfer and there's perfect 20 foot bombs at cloud break coming through like i wouldn't be able to live with myself if i was a pro surfer and i didn't go and surf that day and i was like you know what you're fucking right if i got paid to be in you know proper surfing condition and there was all the best big wave guys in the world and a million eyeballs on me and jet skis to come grab me and cloud break was 20 foot and i'm i'm, I'm like i feel like i'm buying my own coffin right now saying this but yeah i would I feel like <laughs> i would have to paddle out <laughs> For the record, I'm not buying my own coffin. <laughs> I was there and had, there was never a question I was going to paddle out. Really? Oh, fuck. I mean, it's funny. Like, so Vaughn was there. Yeah. And like, the great thing about that is that the the really psycho one, the big gurgler that no one caught, but I think it's Healy's boards, like in the lip yes. and it looks like a toothpick. Um, Vaughn is in it's the fort. Brian Bielman photo, I believe. Bielman, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Google Brian Bielman for Prince. Um, Vaughn is in the foreground of that photo, like, but I, I, the perspective looks like he's right there, but I'm pretty oh, sure he's like, like hundred, out. yeah, 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 like 150 <laughs> meters, like down the line, like yeah. out of danger. But he's making this face that looks like he's like in there, and I'm like, man, that's so cool. That would have been worth paddling out just to get the photo, because then you would have blown it up and been like, see, that was me. I was out, yeah, no, I for, out for sure. All right, so let's 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 transition into your time at surfer because i do want to go from surfer to stab and then and then on to to current topics as well sure. so justin hausman todd yeah. pradonovich you started working as an editor and the managing editor at surfer magazine yeah i took over as managing editor it was one of those situations where they just sort of needed help they just had a few there was like titles on the masthead they needed to fill and they just threw me on one and you know it was a, for me it was a dream like and, yeah. and, it, and it was it happened really like sort of it happened at a very special time for me, looking back on it. Right before I took the job, I had seen a big issue of the magazine that had a Jeff McFetridge like drawing on the front. It said addicted on it. And it was like a guy holding the, like a surfboard like it was like a monkey on his back. And I just thought like, holy shit, I've never seen a surfer magazine look like that. Like an artist, big issue. And, you know, bought it. I was like driving down to Half Moon Bay or something out of San Francisco. Bought it, opened it up. And 
saw that this guy Jim knew it, who I'd worked with at Mollusk, who's this English. He was a he was a really talented longboarder in like the mid. 2000s but he had just taken over there as their creative director mm. and then the job popped up and you know jim knew that i was like interested in it and it just sort of like fell into place and so i, I basically made a decision in about 24 hours went and bought a pickup truck and put a camper on it and drove down to southern california and yeah i mean everything since then has been like what my life is now which is kind of weird to think about but yeah i went down and lived out of my pickup truck for nine months and stayed at the surfer offices just like trying to get my like my feet there and i ended up i mean i i think i arrived at a pretty unfortunate time just from the the corporate side of that business you know i remember coming in after because i'd been in hawaii came back and i showed up the day that they had that meeting where they let everybody go and it was pretty incredible to think about it. You know, I don't think people had really wrap their head or, heads around it at that time, but it was like the biggest, you know, sort of heritage brand in surfing to yeah. go under. Yeah. And with it went this like tremendous history. Um, I remember walking into the back warehouse and there just being these huge boxes of those photo flame books. Yeah. And Randy from the warehouse at Transworld and 10, who is a legend in the surf world, Randy, uh, was like, I don't know what we're going to do with these. And I remember just like grabbing as many of them as I could and putting them in my car being like, these have to, like, they can't just disappear. Like, yeah. I know they're not ever going to sell them. They're not like, you know, they're yeah. just sitting there. Well, it's, and I mean, those conversations, are, you know, inside and outside of surfing are kind of all too common these days. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it works. Like, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of evidence to like, oh yeah, like, uh, you know, multi- national corporation like buying out a dozen different titles and then like down like it, it's funny like i mean i i think this year even outside of surfing like you know most of the staff at sports illustrated got hacked yeah you know and i heard this commentary the other day um these media analysts and they were saying that like tony romo's uh broadcast contracts coming up for next season and they yeah. said you know the 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 offers that are being rumored around are like somewhere between like eight and 14 million dollars a year and they're like, that's like 250 Sports Illustrated journalists, which is like, yeah. it's nothing to take away from Tony Romo or this <laughs> no, sort of convergence be. of effort. But it's yeah. like, it goes back to what we were saying, where it's like things that are really special that become windows to a broader existence yeah. and actually then like fuel the initial thing that you experienced it through in a really positive way are disappearing up their own assholes because people are just like, oh no, like... <laughs> this one thing is, you know, this one surfer yeah. is where we're going to pay everything. Yeah. Or this one publication is it. And it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think so much is sort of compromised through that. I guess, you know, to be seen in a lot of ways. But No, I think you're absolutely right. And, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's why I feel like a lot of people seeing those situations nowadays play out is why subjects like universal basic income and salary caps and stuff like that are on the table because it's hard to justify that when you see that when you're like oh this person this single person's salary could float the entire staff of writers that just got laid off you know what yeah. i mean it's yeah. like that balance doesn't seem reasonable to me no i think especially when you look at the potential body of work over the course of how many years and the impact that that could have you yeah. know you it it is challenging, I think, in the quote-unquote arts, yes. right? Whether you're producing films or you're writing pieces or you're doing a podcast or I would even uh, submit like having a sports league. Yes. Like a lot of it, what makes it special is you are creating conditions for something really special to happen, yes. right? Where it's like, hey, like, I mean, I'm not an apologist for the ASPWSL or I've probably been paid to be one for a while. Um, <laughs> but the point is like... Do you have that on your, on your business card, paid apologist? Paid apologist. <laughs> I, I think I, you know, last week when I was dying from the cold, I think I called myself an aging nonconformist or self-professed nonconformist, <laughs> which is probably just like a total oxymoron. But I, my, my point would be is that, you know, for all that it can be improved, right, with like rankings and formats and schedules and judging, et cetera, et cetera. Like at the end of the day, all that just creates this platform for, the best surfers you can find in the best waves you can find and something really special to happen. Of like course. the Italo thing for me, and, and I fancy myself as someone who's pretty close to it at the time, like most of the Western surfing world just had no idea who he was. Like yep. when he qualified, we're like another Brazilian, okie dokie, cool name. And I remember the first one for me personally, I'm sure everyone's got their own story. He put out an edit from the Triple Crown season that he qualified during of just him at Rocky Point. And I was, and I, it was the first time I looked up and was like, oh, 
Yeah, it's like Rocky pointing off the wall. I know the exact wow. edit you're talking about. Right? And I'm like, oh, wow. Like, he's, yeah. that's special. Yeah. But he wasn't even fully formed into like a world champ at that time either. Totally. But the point is this is like, without those conditions, he's not the world champ. Yeah. Like, and, and I would, and I, you know, I'm sounding like an apologist here or even cheerleader. But I guess my point is, is that there's a parallel between that and having a robust creative staff 100%. trying to tell surfing story. Right? Totally. Or, you know, having a creative, robust staff that those surfers, you know, the surfers that aren't just committed to doing contests, that's right. that those surfers want to work with. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a, the creative outlet that like draws that energy. Um, and it's it's funny we're talking about corporate takeovers because when that's always funny, <laughs> saddest thing <laughs> ever. Uh, but you know, right after surfing got closed, when all right, so when surfing closed, uh, Xander Morton was the editor. Yep. Him and I both took these sort of like. I think that we were called editors at large or something like that. We took these like very like random yeah, titles. A nebulous title where it's like I can do a little work or nothing, yeah. whatever you want. And I had my own frustrations with with Surfer at that time just because I was seeing the limitations that working with a corporate organization has as far as just how difficult it is to get things through bureaucratic nonsense. Yeah. And just sort of like the limitations of vision from the people that were in those like upper positions. Yeah. And it's hard for a kid that's like pulling up in a 1990 pickup truck, not making any money, sitting down with guys in like shitty leather jackets that are driving Porsche Carreras, like showing up trying to talk to you about like ROIs on things where you're like, come on. Yeah, that's not why I started. This isn't, these, yeah, these aren't the conversations that yeah. I wanted to have. But, and also for the record, not something that works. Like, no, I mean, it's kind of, the, yeah. Oh, um, so I, I got sent on a trip to, I was supposed to do a story about the Canary Islands. And so I just, bailed and went to Europe to like base the trip out of there and did like three months in Europe. I traveled around the QS with a few friends, this guy Goni Zubi Zaretta and Aritz and all those guys and just sort of saw Europe and came back to LA. My girlfriend at the time was living up here and ran into Sam McIntosh. But we always just had these really nice conversations. He asked me what I was doing. I told him I'd just come back from this trip and what was going on with Surfer. And that night he just sent me a message and was like, hey, you want to get coffee tomorrow? And at the time, Stab had just gone through like three or four years of corporate ownership from Surf Stitch. They'd That's been right. bought. And so it was this like layer cake of brands. It was Surf Stitch, Swell.com. You Surf know, Dome. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Coastal yeah. Watch. I forget. Something else. But yeah, the idea was that it would be like a media outlet, a retailer, a surf report, blah, 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 blah. And so we met for coffee in LA and, he, you know, I sat down and he put a computer in front of me and played for me the doc, that first one, the the one they did in Bali with the Volcom team. The, oh yeah. The the doc, D-O-C-K. Yeah. Not documentary. No. Yes. <laughs> it was just all right. Was just... Um, and he's, he was like, so I'm buying Stab back. Like we're trying, we're in the middle of making the purchase right now. I need someone to take over as an editor in chief. Like. This is the first project that we're going to roll out. And he gave me the backstory on it, in which I'm sure he'll hate me telling this story. But uh, Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, when he went to, you know, to give the proposal, you know, nobody believed it. You know? And it was like basically a $250,000 project probably you know, just to execute. And he just wanted to do it. He just believed in it. You know? He was like, oh, this is a thing that will like, stop people in their tracks. And so he told them if he didn't get a million views in a week that – it was on them, like the whole project. It was like their advertising contract for the year was free. And so like right as I'm having this conversation with about taking over, like he's about to release this video. And in the back of my head, I was like, holy shit, that's risky. <laughs> like that is writing checks that your ass can't cash. And yeah, so he, you know, over the period of like three weeks or a month, he bought back Stab. I took over him and a guy named Tom Bird, who's our publisher in Australia, who's an old friend of his. And immediately it was like so obvious the difference in the like the the sort of like limberness of a smaller organization that like we could come up with an idea say yes and execute it and start you know talking to brands that day and that the project for me on that was the acid test you know i you know he's like what do you want to do and i was like i've always had this idea about getting like an a-list surfer to ride like the same way you guys do stab in the dark the first time i saw it i was like ah oh, if you could do stories about all these other shapers that never get their due time with a-list professional surfers right and he kind of liked the idea he thought it was kind of cool and then i was talking to a friend of mine who'd been wanting to open a shop that just had like this giant library of surfboards and i was telling him about the project and he were, we were trying to come up with names for it and he's like what about the electric acid surfboard test and i was like god damn it <laughs> i was like so i called him i was like steven his name's steven buttercup he's uh he used to be paul fisher's manager 
I was like, Stevie, can I steal that name for our the new series that we're gonna do? And he's like, Yeah, go for it. Just you know, if if anybody ever asks, you got the name for me. Hey Sam, guess what I came up with? So I walked in and I was like, So I was like, What do you think about the electric acid surfboard test? Like and he's like, Like the Tom Wolf book? I was like, Yeah. He's like, Fucking oath. Done. And so we started talking about it and I was like, you know, I had all these ideas that were like to me very like fully formed. I was like, you know who people like to see on all these boards? Mikey February or Asher Pacey or Torrin Martin. And he's like, what do you mean? People watch those guys all the time. Mm-hmm. He's like, let's get Dane to do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's get Dane to do it. <laughs> he called Dane. Dane's like, yeah, sure. When do you want to do it? It's like his first project back from having twins. Yeah, sure. Um, As a father of twins, I can attest that it's an easy yes. Yeah. Like, uh, you want me to go to Mexico and surf? Yeah. <laughs> who, are, who are, doesn't matter who you are. I'm in. Just yeah. tell me where you go. That's true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that was like the first really big project that I worked on that felt like what we could do. Right. You know, it was like, oh, we can make these like really like important long form films that have storytelling and that also have all these smaller feature films attached to them. And that that's like the model for our bigger projects is like a full length with 10 short profile films about the shapers with sort of a narrative around each one of them. And working with our filmers, you know, working on the, on that series with Dane, because Dane edited that with us and more or less directed it with me and Sam. And then working with Sam Moody, who I brought on, who has been our like gun for hire since I took over. Sam's a little punk rock kid from the East Coast, from Wilmington, North Carolina. And he, he has cystic fibrosis and works harder than anyone I've ever seen and has been absolutely instrumental to pretty much every big creative project that we've had over the past two years and working with him like we both learned how to make these things together i'd never made a full-length surf film before i'd done a few little stuff you know, little projects for surfer and like helped other people but never like my own you know project and, and ever since that one that's sort of what we get tapped for is these sort of full-length films between 15 and 45 minutes i'm interested in you know, going back to the original question of what is an editor in yeah. the surfing world in 2020 because you know you you have your background, you talk about the electric acid surfboard test, you're now the face and host of the Red Bull show mm. that you guys do, uh, the van show that you guys do. And I'm interested if there is any parallels to how you were trained from the new school and your influences in terms of journalism and putting yourself in the story a little bit. Or does it go back to what we were talking about where it's like, hey, it's it's kind of part of 2020 telling stories. You sometimes have to flex into being a part of it as well. Well... Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, obviously, like those, the writers that you're referring to, that sort of new school, of, I mean, it's where, where they went to the new school, but it's also that new journalism school of writers who were sort of like this, you know, they were, they were, were very clearly the wandering eye that you were following. Right. Um, and I always thought that that was like the most honest form of journalism in a weird way, especially nowadays where it feels like unless you've experienced it, you can't say for sure if it's real. You know what I mean? I feel like nowadays there's so many layers of, of that obstruct you from seeing things clearly that you kind of have to intersect yourself and be immersive with it and go and experience it. And for us, what we do, like that's the beauty of what we do. It's like, it's no fun sitting in a room calling people to do an interview. It's fun to go and be at that, you know, to be at a session at Mavericks with those guys and to see what that person, you know, if you say that someone's a pussy, to be able to see them not paddling out and to be in that situation to know what it feels like, it's a, it's a, you're going to write about it in a much more fully formed way instead of being like, oh, I can't believe that, you know, it's like this year in Tahiti, for example, Yago Dora didn't get a second wave in his heat. Yago is fucking gnarly at chopes. Yeah. Like one of, one of the most stylish guys out there as far as goofy foots go and not in any way afraid. <laughs> like he had a helmet ready to go. Like, he, you know, just didn't get a wave. But it's, it's funny that like from the outside, they're like, see, the Brazilians are pussies. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's all, there's all, <laughs> like, it's a whole other podcast. And this is not just like comments. Xenophobia this is like, and yeah, some of the best writers that write about professional surfing ever mentioning that. And you're like, you weren't there. You were sitting on a computer at home thinking that that's what you saw. You didn't call anybody to ask what happened. You didn't hit Yago and say, hey, what happened with that second wave? Yeah, and, he, and, and I think that's part, like it's, and that's part of the modern media landscape where it's like it's speed over accuracy or speed yes. over context. And it's similar to what you talked about with Lewis, where it, Lewis's credibility in calling people out for not paddling out is grounded in his the reality in which he would. Yes. You know, and I think he's a, been to Cloud Rake when it's 15 foot. He's right. seen it big. Like he knows what that place feels like. Yeah. He's been there during a contest. And it's funny. Like I think surfing, it's it's a funny tension of the more mainstream it gets, 
similarly, the intimacy requires a little bit of niche credibility as well. Yeah. You know, in terms of teasing these things out, you kind of have to go as native as possible to understand yeah. and, con and contextualize. Yeah. No, 100%. What What have been some of the bigger controversies or maybe the biggest controversy you've had to deal with um, as Stab's editor-in-chief so far? Well, fuck. I feel like every time Mikey Ceramella puts a story up, I'm like putting out fires. <laughs> Uh, biggest controversy that I've had to deal with. Huh, I'd have to think about that for a second. Was it your punch up? <laughs> no, God. Uh, for me, that was like, a, I think that that situation, and I feel like this is probably the case for most conflicts, is that when you deal with something publicly, it forces you to sort of catalyze and define what it is that you stand for. Mm. And for me, it's always been that like, I wanted to, to make work and to work for a company that like, if I was a 15 year old kid, it would be all I wanted to go on. When I, when I turned on my computer, it was the first thing I wanted to go look at. And if I could dream, that would be where I'd want to have my first surf edit. That'd be the job that I'd wanted to take. It'd be where I'd want my photos or videos, you know, published. And it's a company that I'd want to work for. Mm -hmm. um, and starting from scratch, you know, I mean, we basically, you know, buying Stab back in 2000 and what was it 17, yep. 18? Um, we were basically starting a business from scratch, yeah. you know, with, you know, quite a bit of following and clout. But as far as like being able to afford to to bring on these these filmers and to pay these people who, you know, especially with, you know, it was right after surfing closed. There was all these these amazing creative people that didn't have any any outlets. Yeah. And so for us, it was like this mission that we felt like we were on to like rebuild something that had a place for everybody. You know, that was like, it was what we wanted. It was the, the, the surfers that we wanted to work with and the filmers and the videographers and the writers. And to build that sort of ecosystem to where we could show what we wanted to see in surfing. You know, we wanted to build the surf media that didn't exist at the time. Which I think it speaks to the conglomeration negativity as well where it's like totally. the amount of meat on the surfing bone year after year in terms of people doing amazing stuff is so vast yeah and it's like i i mean it's a funny thing where again people kind of naturally gravitate towards like and for years like every publishing company in the surfing world and the asp and everyone says we're telling the kelly story it's yeah. like okay great i'm sure it will be tell told well yeah <laughs> and comprehensively or maybe not um and but there are hundreds of other stories out there yes. that provide context and, that, and make an impact on people. And yeah. I get the thing about the surfing journalist thing too. Like, I, I mean, I think that like the first time I met Sean Doherty at a beer with him was a, like a high water mark in my life remains one. Yeah. Because you, again, these people were like, they were guides for us in formative years, you know, totally. for, for different reasons. And you're like, man, you introduced me to just a way of thinking or just a language or an yeah. entirely new part of my life that is, a pillar to today and i met you yeah you know yeah and yeah that they're that they're like ideas and insights into the world that i was obsessed with helped like me make sense and shape my own identity around that obsession which by all accounts is like why i have the life that i have now you know what i mean is because i had that this idea that you could travel around and do this type of work and work with surfers on you know, on this level, it, you know, there's times where it feels like I just like manifested this reality out of thin air sometimes. It's like, I'll be at a tour stop and I'll be like, I thought there was a lot of people doing this. You know, there's just not that many guys anymore unless they work for you guys, which for all of the criticism that the WSL gets, you guys never, ever get credit for all of the ridiculously talented people that you guys employ that are on tour. Well, I've we, gotten we, to yeah. know firsthand and who I'm very grateful for. <laughs> well, we, we work hard to get in our own way so we don't get credit sometimes. <laughs> the, um, you mentioned electric acid surfboard test. Yep. I'm incredibly jealous because I'm big on acronyms and East is very fucking cool. <laughs> Dane Reynolds was season one, yep. Steph Gilmore season two. Yep. You're coming out with season three. Explain who so, and what you can tell us. I can tell you, uh, we are in, we actually just looked at a rough cut last night. So this year's acid test is with Noah Dean. Never um, heard of him. <laughs> uh, with uh, the second generation Gold Coast phenom, Noah Dean, the son of the late great Wayne Dean, who was a surfer in the you know one of the that area's best surfers in the late '60s, whose talent bridged both in, whether he was shaping or surfing from the late '60s to until about four years ago. Yeah. Um. Uh. So yeah. So we wanted to do Noah. Noah's famously a guy that only rides one board. Like you watch any of his edits and he's on the same board. He's on a six one Luke Short thruster. And occasionally he'll like you know, you might see a one one or two waves of him on something different, but it's 
almost to a point, he rides one board. He came to stab high with a bunch of six ones. And so it's for us, like the idea with that is that we want to see genuine like surprise and like education happening in front of them, of them like trying to wrap their heads around these boards the same way that you or I would, but just with a slightly better understanding of, you know, Slight. surfing. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this year we've, so we we filmed the acid test on the North Shore. We went early season and stayed at the Volcom House for about three weeks. We've got 11 shapers in this year, a few uh, return guests that, that did well in the previous one and a, f- a bunch of new faces, a bunch of Hawaiians. And we're going to do a premiere for that at the Volcom Pipe Pro and then a handful of premieres between February and March. And then we'll release it, I believe, around the Quicksilver Pro. Digitally. Um, Digitally, yep. yeah. Cool. Um, so with those, our big thing is, since the shapers are so such an important part of all of those communities, we want we try to show those films in those areas where those shapers are around so that they can come out and be a part of it. And, you know, that, that whole project is sort of a celebration of those people. It's a celebration of those sort of fringe characters that have been either, they've been shaping boards for decades, just sort of, you know, doing their thing without any celebrity around them. Or they have some sort of iconic contribution to surfboard design that deserves to be sort of you know, put through a new filter. Or they're a young shaper that's like sort of just cutting their teeth and be like starting to earn a reputation. So this year we've got Daniel Jones, McCall Jones' younger brother, who has a shaping bay at Rocky Point and builds some of the most aesthetically beautiful surfboards I've ever seen. But yeah, he made a, a little twin fin swallowtail that Noah really liked. Blake Peters from Panda, Australian guy that lives in Newport, who again, like a small label that started up that's become like a very like cool aesthetic, like fringe brand that makes really amazing high performance boards and then we had you know icons we had wade decoro who was noah's dad's best friend in hawaii who they collaborated on boards and wayne had shaped out of wade's shaping bay over the years we had we had decoro build like a seven six pipe shooter that was uh templated off of one of wayne's personal boards and just yeah so it's a bunch of Sounds really awesome. cool equipment well, good and waves n- we n- scored early season we were really nervous about it um and, and yeah. noah's such a I mean, he's such an amazing surfer, yeah. super good kid. And uh, I mean, last year, I'll, maybe it's not Rubu 99, maybe it's R-U-B-U, I'm not sure. Rubu. Rubu, okay. Yeah. yeah. I pronounced it wrong on the voiceover. I literally, I just got sent a rough cut and I said, I think I called it like R-U-994 and I don't even remember saying it. Oh, it, the edit blew my mind. The Slayer yeah. bit at the end. Um, my kid's six. He very much enjoys it. <laughs> and um, yeah, he, he's like, I don't know, he's like, we get some more Slayer. And I'm like, no, I mean, no. No, sure. No. What could go wrong? That's the right age. That's right. That's yeah. A, yes, yes. Yeah. That's right. That's, that, that is the correct age to receive rain and blood for Christmas. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, Seasons it's, in the abyss. Go that's for right. It. It's Harry Potter, rain and blood. Yeah. What, I mean, the the spirit's the same. I mean, he probably <laughs> thinks it's like book nine or something. He's like, is it the? Is it? He goes, the arts. Harry the Potter same. book nine. Seasons in the abyss. Uh, now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. So before I let you go. 2020 predictions from the editor in chief of Stab Magazine. 2020 predictions. Surfing, surfing based. We can get, we can go all sorts of areas on this. Uh, I think that this is going to be one of the craziest years that we can recall. I think it's great that it's the beginning of a new decade. Uh, I think surfing in the Olympics and the ISA surfing games are going to be much more interesting than people expect for different reasons than people probably expect them to be. And I just say that after having gone to the ISA games in Japan um, and feel and like the palpable difference on the sand at those contests versus the WSL contest and not in a negative or positive way, but just the nationalistic aspect of it being like the sort of the point of it at those events, I think is pretty interesting. We're doing a full world tour for Stab High, if I can do some shameless plugs. That's, that's <laughs> why we have the podcast. So, um, someone should be plugging something. <laughs> so our first uh, our first Stab High event this year is going to be at the Melbourne Wave Pool that just opened up uh, at the end of March. It's going to be March 21st, I believe, 20th and 21st. And that to us, I think that that'll probably end up being one of the, the That'll be the thing that takes up most of our energy this year as far as like our the bandwidth that people don't see. And that's largely Sam McIntosh and Tom Bird's like that's their baby. And our and Vans and Monster um have gotten behind it in a really big way. Which for us, you know, it came from going to 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 your guys' contest, to the Surf Ranch contest, and seeing like what it was like to have a curated experience where people could hang out and watch surfing like right in front of them and talk and drink and oh, yeah. taking out all those variables. And we were at that contest when Seth dropped that flip. Then and like the sort of Waco reveal. Sure. Sent Mikey C on Monday. Sam came in and was like, we're throwing a contest. And two months later, we learned how to fucking, we're not learned. We were throwing our first contest and learning the hard way how to do it. Sure. And, to, and, and this is what I will say, which was a, a very big learning lesson for us, which Sam always says, whenever he hears anybody talk or speak poorly about what you guys do, he goes, you have no fucking idea. 
no idea what goes in to a broadcast for a surf contest, Hello, especially right. one that is on location halfway around the world with all of the variables that involve weather. For us, being able to hold a contest in a, by all means, a modern little place with, you know, good electrical outlets and Wi-Fi and a wave that shows up on time, it's very, very difficult. Sure. He, mu he must go horse in the stab offices if he's got to correct that kind of attitude. <laughs> I'm kidding. The, um, um, you know, I, I do think it, you know, one of those things that I, I meant to bring this up earlier, but I'm going to bring it up now because we're here. I feel like the Hurley story and the impact that is going on with the surfers and the industry and just the surfing world in general yeah. has so far been kind of underserviced a little bit. So I'll, I'll say this now because this is going to air in five days and the story will have already gone live. But the story behind that the Hurley layoffs and the Hurley purchase, I think is probably the biggest industry story of the past 10 years. And the shift that's about to happen because of that, I don't think people have any idea about. I, I can just talk about it. So, Yeah, no, if you it'll be live. Don't worry. <laughs> Tell us everything that so, you know. If you think about professional surfers as a neighborhood and John John Florence as being like the mansion in that neighborhood that's worth $100 million, mm -hmm. that's clearly a bit more it's 50 percent more than it was 10 years ago you know it's like a grossly overinflated product no one else in that neighborhood has any problems in it because it lifts all of their values right the second that that value the value of that house of the, the second the value of the marquee surfer in surfing drops which by all accounts it seems like it's anywhere from 50 to 70 percent sure of what that salary is going to drop which for john john it was what was it thirty million dollars over ten years or something like that? I forget what it was. He, and I think he has a, I think he has eleven the, million the dollars check, left yeah. on his contract. Right. Um, okay, maybe I'm picking up the dinner check. Which him him his pay getting cut that significantly drops every other surfer in the entire marketplace's salary. Yeah. To you know to whether it's a more organic salary or whether it's a more reasonable amount of money for a surfer to get paid doing what they're doing is a completely different argument. Hello, Pat. God, you look so good in a scarf. Pat O'Connell just walked in because he <laughs> he heard we were talking about Hurley, and he's like, "Do you have another microphone? I've got some hot oh, takes." You look like a Disney version of Pat O'Connell, sick right now, the, with the with the like scarf and the whole. <laughs> you he's like it. he's like if when you, you are, when you premiere the red flannel in, shirt, the red flannel shirt, and the <laughs> your Frozen I, Three character looks fucking awesome. I get made fun of when I go up to Frozen. I'll wear a hooded wetsuit with no booties. Yeah. Like, Dude, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> That's not the reason. <laughs> <laughs> um where were we at uh yeah overinflated. oh yeah, yeah so right. yeah so so and and presumably what hurley's gonna do i mean and that's when you when a company like that takes over a brand like hurley like it shouldn't be a surprise that when they look at the books and see the amount of money they bring in per year versus the amount of money they spend on salaries mm. comparable to a brand like nike you know nike brings in what 30 billion dollars a year or something like that hurley might bring in 300 million right and to have an athlete like John that's, you know, he, by all means, he should be the most, he should be the highest paid surfer on the planet. Mm. But to see the, the, the difference that that shift is going to make, I think this year is going to be pretty radical. I don't think we'll ever have seen that many, sh like, sudden sponsor changes and shifts and surfers taking salaries that are one-tenth, one-twentieth of what they were getting paid two or three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the the bookend of this chapter, which is, as you put it, like we're starting a new decade, it's kind of like symmetrical in a lot of ways for when they came in and arguably inflated a lot of the salaries 100%. Um, or artificially inflated. I I, um, I have a hot take on this that you can uh, jam into your, <laughs> Give it to your, me. <laughs> your article or not. So when this was all going down was during the North Shore season. I was staying with Pat, who just came in and was having coffee with a lot of folks from Hurley every morning. Yeah, And was kind of getting the blow by blow as this was happening. And the thing that drew me, that, that really made me bananas trying to wrap my head around it was, you know, and, and I might be speaking out of, out of school here a little bit, but like Bob has said he's no longer involved. Yeah. The Hurley family is no longer involved. I would extend the definition of the Hurley family to also be all the people that Bob brought in around his yeah, orbit Bob's that people. were core to what that brand actually was. Yeah. And then the reports come out about these like really aggressive contract negotiations or dropping surfers and this and that. And I'll pause and say, it it doesn't feel like it's as black and white in the surfing world because I think surfers are at their core nonconformists and either explicitly or implicitly side-eye anyone that makes money off of surfing. 
Yes. We can have a longer psychological conversation on whether that's valid or not. Sure. But I do think they're just like, well, you know, they're making money off of surfing. I'm not like, screw them. Yeah, it's, it's just like, a sort of knee-jerk reaction, thinking that that doesn't in totally. some way filter down to them having a like robust or or that ecosystem like, of yeah. surf culture, or that put yourself in their shoes and and tell me you would have acted different. You know, well, like also if you were a corporate suit, like these guys aren't surfers, they don't they don't care that like John John Florence is X Y and Z. They just see a guy that they've never heard of getting paid four million dollars a year. But, okay, but here's my hot take on it. Right, so two things, if the, if Blue Star Alliance is going to do all this. Why did you go through the trouble? Like, what did you actually buy? Oh, they bought a they bought a brand with name recognition that they will put in big box in, in big box retailers all around the world for a significant amount cheaper than what they were doing before, and they'll make money. I think they will. It'll be a Massimo or a you know. I mean, oh, there's so many of those. There's so many. There's so many examples like Ocean Pacific Massimo, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I don't think it's. I don't think that that translates 100% to 2020 when the consumer is a lot more conscious about where their money's going. That's why Patagonia has done so well because people want to uh, consume things in a substantive manner. So if I am a consumer, even if I'm six degrees separated from this disaster, yeah. I'm just like, why would I bother? Well, I mean, if I'm Blue Star Alliance, why wouldn't I just start something from scratch? Now, I will say one more thing, which is I understand there was an offer from Bob and stance to buy it back from Nike as well. Whether or not this was equitable to the Blue Star Alliance offer, I don't know, but just suspending reality for a second, let's say it was. Nike do hold some responsibility for letting this thing die on the vine. A hundred percent. So and I, they didn't want they, they didn't want a difficult like transition. They didn't want, you know, any of that stuff. And I also don't think that they wanted a competitor. Well, so okay. So that that Because I me, do feel like Hurley yeah. carved out a weird space where people would instead of wearing Hurley, they would wear Nike. Because that, it was the same thing to them. And they've always wanted to wear Nike. That to me is the only valid reason why you would let this thing die and yeah. sell it to Blue Star. Other, I, I otherwise bet that, I bet that's what it is. Otherwise, I don't accept any rhetoric around how much they care about sports or athletes or performance or human transcendence at all. Because if they really did, they would have sold this thing back to Bob and Bob would have kept this thing going in yeah. A different form, but it would have been more true to what he started out to do. Or they would have just kept making surf stuff on, with a Nike label yeah. and put some surfers on their team that were those transcendent characters as like the pinnacle of what a professional surfer, you know, like put John John Florence on Nike. Oh, yeah. I mean, the amount of world champions and world title contenders, men and women across all these divisions that are going to be impacted by this and the ripple effect across everything else is like, we have no idea what we're going to look at this year. Oh, and the, the, the reality of that happening on the eve of surfing being in the Olympics for the first time seems very strangely timed to me. You know what I mean? For a brand like Hurley who seems, or Nike, who seems uniquely positioned to take advantage of whoever those new eyeballs are looking at surfing, to walk away from it six months beforehand after you know, however many years of difficulty, to, you know, 12 years since 2008. Well, I look forward to reading the uh, STAB article about it and to potentially being cited as a, an anonymous, um, self-professed <laughs> nonconformist. <laughs> Before um, we go, we have the lightning round. Yeah, hit so me. 10 questions, answer as quickly as you can. Ooh. One board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless? Quad. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? Fucking burrito. Last book you read? Uh, the last book I read was When Godel Walked with Einstein. Best surf film ever. Mm, sea of Darkness. One wave you never have to go back to. Cocoa Beach, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. J-Bay. Best person to share a lineup with? Yago Dora. Worst person to share a lineup with? Me. Finish the sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Ooh, that is an... Ext uh, by... <laughs> that lightning round. Read the question again. I will, I will... I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Mm, so this implies that happiness is, a, is, a, is a, a temporary state of existence. Interpret as you like. Okay. Uh, I, I'm honestly... I feel like I'm happy at the end of every event that we do that doesn't go pear-shaped. So, so this podcast. So this podcast, I feel like we've gotten to the end. You're here. I'll walk out and I'll be like, that was a nice conversation with Dave. And I'll feel great for the rest of the day. No, I would say 
finishing the acid test and premiering it in Hawaii at the Volcom House with all those boys will be the next moment of elation for me and for most of Stab, I'd say, which will should be happening at the Volcom Pipe Pro, which hopefully there'll be waves for that. But that whole, I'm very much looking forward to that experience after I did two months in Hawaii and then came back, was in California for like two days and then way too long in Florida. Uh, and now Hawaii's, or uh, California's cold and flat and I'm very excited to get back to Hawaii and to show this movie. But it's uh, it's been fun working on it. And it's been nice being back in in California for a little bit. Excellent. Ashton Goggins, thanks for coming on the lineup. So that's it. That's our conversation with Ashton Goggins. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't listened to the other pods, please download, listen, and subscribe if you like them. As mentioned in the upfront, we'll be back next Tuesday with episode 13. Hope you get some waves wherever you are, and we'll see you then.